once again because we've got uh, Jamie Carr, Academy coach at Manchester City with us in studio. Jamie, how are you getting on? Yeah, really good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. So you're here to talk about football, which you will get to in a moment, but most importantly, the incredible challenges that you're undertaking this year. So if you haven't heard about this, so you are currently training for the Marathon des Sables in the Sahara Desert. It's described as the toughest foot race on earth. That's at the end of March. And then in December 2022, because that's not enough, you're going to be taking part in a race across the Atlantic Ocean, rowing alone and unsupported. So you're going to be covering more than 3,000 miles from La Gomera on the Canary Islands all the way over to Antigua. And you're doing all these challenges in support of Cancer Fund for Children, which is a charity which supports children with a cancer diagnosis in Ireland and their families. The charity is fundraising at the moment to build a second therapeutic centre in Kong, County Mayo, and they need to raise over 12 million euro to do so. Just first of all, before we get into the challenges, why have you picked this charity? How close is it to your heart? And, and, and the work they do looks absolutely incredible. Yeah, so I, I kind of stumbled across Cancer Fund for Children um, online and um, straight away I was just drawn into the great work they do, some of the videos and stuff that I've seen on their website and then having gone to visit Daisy Lodge and seen the great work they do, it's just been phenomenal and um, they're supporting so many people across Ireland and the need for the second short break centre is there. So uh, we're doing everything we can now at the moment to fundraise and, um, and help them get where they need to get to for the second facility. As I say, at the end of March is when you do the marathon, they sap. Where is the training at at the moment? <laughs> the training is going well. Um, I completed probably the longest run I'm going to do in training last weekend, which was 53k. So uh, I've got the next month to sort of keep ticking along and add in some more big mileage weeks, but uh, probably nothing as, as big as that. So i um, feeling like I'm in a good place and uh, the key now is just to make sure you stay injury free in the lead up to the next sort of uh, three or four weeks. What is the programme of the race? So it's essentially 250 kilometres spread over six days. So you have more or less a marathon a day until you get to day four. And then on day four, it goes crazy and you do a double marathon. So you get through day four, which is the big sort of hurdle. And then after that, you have one more marathon and then you get your medal and you're done. What kind of temperatures, Jamie? <laughs> I'm getting like, I'm getting dizzy even uh, listening to you. Talk. What kind of temperatures are we talking about? I imagine they're pretty consistent. You can hang your hat in terms of what you're going to be experiencing over the course of those six days, what, what are you looking at? Yeah, it's crazy. So last year, I think they registered like 55 to 58 degrees, which is... Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wish. So, um, yeah, it's Jesus. hard to get your head around. Because how do you... You have, you've got a full-time... Sorry, I'm taking over now. You've got a full-time job. Uh, you're getting your training in, but surely the, in terms of you need to immerse yourself in that, those kind of conditions you need to be trained in that for a significant amount of time surely you can't just drop yourself into that for, for the period of six days when you've been yeah. running up the, the M6 or M56 <laughs> around Manchester or whatever like you know what I mean yeah 100% luckily enough Man City have provided me with their heat chamber so I can get somewhat acclimatised before I go out there really but yeah I've been working in the heat chamber at about 40 degrees at the moment and that's tough so I've got another nice colour there I'll say that <laughs> like, has, has own isn't he yeah the, nice little spin off <laughs> nice little spin off yeah, yeah. Like, that's the part. <laughs> really and that's and that's getting you where you need you need to be yeah there's going to be a certain level of unknowns and that you just can't prepare for because the humidity yeah. out there and all sorts and just the conditions you're not going to be able to replicate like sand dunes and all sorts so basically you're doing what you sand can sand dunes camels you can't replicate camels can you <laughs> no okay. exactly In Manchester yeah. either like yeah <laughs> yeah no the British winter is not a good training uh, venue for the Sahara Desert <laughs> Do you ever see on the training pitch the, the, the lads actually think no you're a coach of Manchester City or just that fellow who heads into the tank every morning for six yeah. hours yeah that lunatic they see yeah that's about it I was at, yeah exactly so the odd person comes in and out of the heat chamber and they're probably thinking who is this crazy guy but yeah time Jamie I mean do you have a do you have a spare do you have time do you have time to yourself for personal <laughs> anything does anything else yeah. exist outside of your work and your you're training well this is a big hobby of mine doing these sort of adventures doing these challenges so um it's a hobby but one thing i'm, I'm learning at the moment is running a campaign is almost a full-time job on its own in terms of looking yeah. for sponsors driving fundraising so yeah. it's kind of like i've got my day job with city academy i've then got the training which is uh, my part-time job and then i've got running a campaign on top of that so yeah it's all fun and games Wh whereabouts are you whereabouts in the sahara does the race take place so basically you fly to Morocco right. and then you, they drive you six hours into the Sahara Desert in the middle of nowhere, which you don't get told where. And then on, on, on that day, they'll tell you, right, from here on, you're now doing X amount of kilometres in this direction and uh, that will be your finish mark. And it changes each year, each time, so you don't know how long you're doing or exactly where you're going. So right. it's hard to prepare, really. It's an unbelievable mental challenge. 
Yeah, it's going to be tough. Um, yeah, and dealing with the conditions, it, I'm not doing it to break any records or anything like that. It's more of a race just to to survive and push myself really, and uh, and test myself. And I'm really looking forward to that sort of day four where it's 85 kilometres. I know it sounds crazy, but uh, that's the day where you'll learn a lot about yourself. I can imagine. And many runners, sorry, uh, is there a team of uh, many people? Are it's just yeah. yourself? No, 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 it's a race. This, oh, this is a proper a race. race. It right. happens every year. I think there'd be about 400 people do it each year from all over the world. Right, good. Yeah, 400 of the lunatics so yeah it should be fun it helps doesn't it I'd imagine Jamie <laughs> mentally it helps having that but yeah. seeing bodies people alongside you as opposed to would have thought doing it by yourself in solitude is absolutely yeah well direct, like just having people there and pushing yourselves like day in day out they say that it, so, so in some ways it's great to have the, the the people around you to push you but on yeah. the other hand when you see other people in like dropping out it can be all, also a negative yeah you're like, just oh. dropping down the sides of those sand dunes yeah, just going really down and down exactly exactly <laughs> the one thing that is probably not very communal whatsoever is going to be when you hop into a boat then later this year <laughs> and try and row across the Atlantic has the training started for that yet or are you just waiting until the marathon is done good question Essen <laughs> essentially the funny thing is and every time I tell people this they laugh I've never set foot in the rowing boat before in my life I've never rowed a stroke in my life and I oh. still haven't got my boat yet. My boat's arriving in a couple ah, of weeks' come on, time. Come on, Jane. Come on, so, now, seriously. <laughs> is, there, is there anything that you're... Are you, are you on the rowing machine, at least? Or? Uh, yeah, I did a solid six-month block on the rowing machine about a year ago. And then, since then, it's just been focused on the run. And then, once I get this run done, then we're, uh, we're into full-on training for the row. So, is it fair to say you've kind of compartmentalised that you haven't thought of that mental challenge yet and what that entails? Yeah, I'm just trying to give the Marathon de Sable the respect it deserves because it's yeah. a really tough race. I don't want to, like, the row is the big one, but if I take my eye off the ball on that one, I might not make it. So it's really important to focus on this one. And then I have six months to, to, to really learn to row and get myself familiarised with the boat. What part of the row, other than the physical stuff, are you perhaps least looking forward to? Like, what do you think will be the, the biggest challenge about being out there for so long? Yeah, so people often say, like, being out there for two or three months on your own would be really difficult. That might be difficult. I don't know because who, who's ever done that? Spent that much time alone? I don't know. Um, it's probably because I'm not experienced in the ocean. I've got no maritime experience. Things like my first storm, like trusting the boat that it's going to get through this. Yeah. Those sort of moments where you're like, well, this is ropey. Um, it's all the sort of unknowns with the ocean I'm sort of not comfortable with yet. Like you have to jump in the, in the water and clean the bottom of the boat every week or so. Otherwise, like... you got to do chores as well. Yeah, exactly, oh, yeah. For God's sake. So it's... I, I don't... I'm not a fan of sharks, so if I see a shark and then they're expecting me to jump in and clean that boat, there's, uh, there's no chance. No. <laughs> uh, like, I mean, there's obviously a, a very, very good cause for why you're doing this. Is there something inside in your own head about proving to yourself that you can do these two things in the same year on top of the brilliant work for charity that you're doing? Uh... Yeah, I suppose it's just the, the, the whole element of challenge. Yeah. I, I really love challenges. Like, I've done loads of small little challenges over the last few years, and, which give me a purpose in the mornings when I wake up. This is what I'm working towards, um, which I lost when I finished playing football. So, yeah, these challenges give me that, and they keep me on track, and uh, they keep me focused and, uh, and driven, really. So, yeah, that's sort of what's driving me to, to get them done. Where can people follow your journey and donate? Yeah, so uh, the nothingventuredcampaign.com is my website. Um, the Nothing Ventured campaign on uh, Instagram as well. And there's a donate page there if, if anyone would like to do so. And I'm still actively looking for sponsors to come on board as well to help me get to where we need to get to for, for uh, Cancer Fund for Children as well. So any support would be massively appreciated. Brilliant. And we'll tweet out links to, to those as well on our social media pages. Jamie, just you mentioned there the football career, that looking for a new challenge after that uh, stopped so can you tell us through talk us through your, your own playing background yeah so uh, fairly unglamorous to be honest played in the League of Ireland the club yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh, played League of Ireland and then when I was so, sort of in my early 20s I realised that I'm not going to be able to have a sustainable career here what was your schoolboy uh, club Jamie you're going to dig in here where did you uh, play Paul your Marnock Paul Marnock yeah, is yeah. that where you're uh, Paul Marnock, Malahoy, that's where yeah, you are. So I live in Baldoyle, yeah. So oh, I got you, like, yeah, yeah. North, north side's on the up home. <laughs> yeah. I've had this conversation before, I've told you. I know. Emmett, North Strand. Yeah. Yeah. All, all north side. I'm telling I'm you, it's I all live, happening, it's I happening. I live the north side, so I mean, we're, we're in good company here, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so did that, and then um, uh, got the opportunity to go to India and work for Reading in the middle of nowhere in the Himalaya Mountains. So I took a gamble and went for that. And then on the back of doing six months out there, they offered me a full-time job in the academy. 
Um, and I spent sort of five years at Reading before then moving to, to Manchester City. Does that come as a result of coaching? Are you doing coaching badges? Are you, are you, are you, are you, how do you work your way into a point where Reading wants you to go and coach abroad? Yeah, so I'd done sort of my coaching badges previously um, before I went to England. So right. um, I went to IT Carlo. Uh, and I did a lot of my coaching badges there, which was which was which was brilliant. Um, but yeah, so they're important. But uh, it's sort of learning on the job. You learn a hell of a lot more than those coaching badges, that's for sure. What was the point of Reading having coaches in India? Good question. Um, still don't know the full answer to that. Other than um, we got sent to the northeast, which is on the Himalayas and the border of China. So uh, very different to coaching in England. Like you're just coaching disadvantaged children that had right. next to nothing which sort of links into why I'm doing these challenges now and supporting children's charities because I saw the impact that such small things can have on children. So, um, yeah, long story short, but yeah, I ended up in India, six months there with no Wi-Fi, no internet, totally different way of life. Um, and then, Food, how do you manage? Oh, like it was, I was interested. Yeah, no. Teddy the food, belly and all that, how would you manage? Yeah, I, Struggle. I got that, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> first time I've ever uh, projectile vomited was in India, so yeah. Um, no, it was crazy. You better get used to that before you get in the boat <laughs> at, the, at the end of the year. Yeah, seasickness oh, and all that. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, life experience is, uh, is unbelievable, isn't it? How old are you now, Jamie? 30. 30. It's scary, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? You don't look back, obviously. Obviously, you're very much in terms of what's ahead of you and, you know, plowing ahead and stuff. But amazing, amazing life story so far. Fair play to you. Feel yeah. A bit, uh, feel, a bit, uh, feel a bit humbled. <laughs> so uh, right. What about yourself? No. I'm feeling humble. You definitely must be feeling oh, about 100%. humble. Oh, one hundred You're closer to the, their childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a weird one. Uh, that point that you made there about, uh, I guess, trying that that trip to India sparks something in you that you want to try and do something good with your career. You want to try and give back a little bit. Like, uh, what what do you see? How does that change? Is a penny dropping when you're on that trip to India, or you're not a trip to India when you're literally working in India and, and immersing yourself there? Or is that something that you always had? W- would you always have done something like this, or is that actually quite a, a pivotal moment in your own career? Yeah, I, I suppose that sparked the interest in helping children. Mm. Um, and then when I got my full time job working with kids day to day, who are trying to achieve their dreams and helping them along that journey, you, you do, it's it's extremely rewarding and you get a nice feeling and. And I do feel like we're all important role models for the next generation and we need to lead and, and do things in the right way. Um, and if I can help a few children along the way do it while doing some things I really want to do, well, well, brilliant. And, and that's sort of where I'm at now. How does Manchester City come up? Um, it was headhunted. Yeah, of course. You only course. take the best, Manchester City. We know that. Very good point. Good agent. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, end up just applying for the job there and uh, yeah, got it. And four years later, still here. Um, and hopefully, it's a brilliant place to work. It's one of the best academies in England and, and even across the world. So uh, what a place to learn. What a place to, to be surrounded by the best players and also the best the coaches as well. So brilliant environment. And you learn so much every day, which is just an absolute privilege. You're probably best suited to the kind of academy system. You mentioned, obviously, on a, a bigger level, you enjoy working with younger children, giving them, obviously, a bit of leadership, giving them a bit of direction and stuff like that. So no real ambition in terms of being you know, the next door is seeing your manager or, or progressing along that kind of career path. You're kind of happy in the environment that you're in in the academy, working with younger players and kind of developing yeah. younger players. Is that, do you kind of see, is that how you see yourself potentially going forward or partly anyway? Yeah, so I miss the competitive element of football as oh, well. Right. Well, like growing up in Ireland, it's all about winning, isn't it? And competition and every weekend, that's what it's all about. And when you go to England in the academy system, it's very different. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I do miss that. And that's yeah. the spark that I do miss from playing. And once you get to sort of 18s up in England, you, competition comes back in. Yeah. So I would like to get back to sort of that at some stage. But I'm in no rush. I'm loving what I'm doing. So whenever that happens, that will happen. Um, yeah. But... Interesting, I'm, I'm yeah. not. I'm not in a race. What age group are you mostly working with in the academy? So I do the under 14s at the academy here, and in Reading I did sort of broad spectrum of teenagers, 12s to 16s. So um, yeah. You say that there's no competitiveness until you get over the age of 18. There, is that a little bit at odds with the idea of an academy in the first place? That you're the kids that are there are possibly there to you know maybe from their parents' perspectives to get a contract one day. So how do you manage to maintain that level of fun? while also maintaining the fact that this is a pretty serious academy on, on a holistic sense. 
Yeah, well, I think we uh, we all can get carried away at times thinking, right, we're working at Man City, we're, we're working with the best players. But also, it's these kids' hobby as well. They're still kids at this stage. So um, you can never lose sight of the fact that it is children playing football at the moment. Yes, they're trying to pursue a career in the game, but they're not there yet. So fun is always an important element of every training session, of, of every part of it. Um, but then it's just drift feeding the little bit more seriousness as it starts becoming a career and and um, things become a little bit more serious because inevitably there's some big decisions that always happen at under 16s in the academy journey mm. and that's when people either get a shock or they get that sort of big boost and step up to the next level. Kids must hate your uh, warm-ups, 16, 16 <laughs> km, <laughs> km warm-ups in the exactly, heat chamber. Exactly, exactly. 18 times around the training ground, <laughs> seeing about two hours lads, <laughs> warm yourselves up. Manchester City going to the fittest academy in about five or six years back. <laughs> is, is, is the academy... At, at that age, dipping into all areas of the world, has scouting begun at, the, at that age or is it more localised? Uh, well, traditionally, uh, it would have been a lot of Europe. European players would have been scouted, but now that Brexit's happened, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out for the English academy system. Um, I know at 16s and up, we used to recruit quite heavily from Spain and other countries like that. However, I don't know if that's going to be possible now. Um, and Obviously, we're seeing a lot of Irish players, young Irish players now going to Italy and the likes of that. So... That'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but uh, certainly national recruitment in the UK is something that takes place f sort of from 12 to 16 at City and a lot of the other top clubs in, in England. So do you reckon that'd be even more concentrated now, Jamie, clearly for the reasons that you've said? I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, to be honest with you. I get a little bit quite excited about the prospect of, and I've got an Irish perspective, but in terms of, right, just a focus shift now in terms of let's get the best players from Europe as opposed to, right, let's broaden out in terms of the surrounding area, you know, 50 miles from Manchester, where's the best kids? Yeah. You know, let's invest in these. Well, he mightn't be ideally what we're looking for, but he's all we've got. Let's let's work with him. Let's try and improve him. The less where Jamie comes in, let's get the best and prove these players. So a lot more kind of localised. I, I think that's quite exciting. Mm. Yeah, it, it will still be national recruitment, but yeah, but, uh, yeah like you said, it'll only be UK-based and potentially anyway it'll be interesting to see how Brexit plays out and how you much don't see too it. many of the London boys come up, come off the road here into Manchester that won't get play down too well will it you know what actually with the Manchester supporters <laughs> it's more it's happening more and more because the North West is just such a competitive environment for signing players yeah. you've got Liverpool United course, yeah. all the clubs so yeah they're starting to branch out and get players from, from all over the country now which is which is interesting um, what, what are you, like what Obviously, Manchester City have done unbelievable work in building that academy over the last little while. What other clubs do you look at enviously? Or obviously, I mean, maybe you don't look at anybody enviously, but what are the other clubs that really good academy setups at the moment? Yeah, so the one, the, the big clubs that you, you'd probably um, know yourselves, like um, Chelsea's very good academy, Liverpool, Man United, they're all good academies. And then you've got sort of the, the, the ones below that that are pushing as well, like Brighton's and stuff are on mm. the way up. Southampton traditionally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so... Uh, previously when I was working at Reading they were quite good at producing players not anymore not anymore James how are you saying <laughs> standards have dropped the last uh, four or five years for exactly. obvious reasons yeah exactly <laughs> for, for, from what you're hearing there Kenny if you could turn the clocks back as a 14 year old oh. to go into this academy would, would you take I that I wish I hadn't brought Jamie in this morning I really <laughs> I, I was reasonably comfortable with me lot you know from 20 to 35 before Jamie came in this morning start rattling off his, uh, his achievements how how do you think you would have got on in under Jamie? Oh, as a as a coach? Yeah. No, as a, he as a player, no, as a, as a young, he would have got a bit out of me as a young player. He yeah. would have got a, a bit out. Um, I would have responded to that. He's obviously very uh, competitive, very uh, I wouldn't say uh, kind of demanding, but kind of um, just his own kind of mentality. I think I would have uh, re responded to that, even in terms of what he's committed to off the pitch. That I would have found that I would have been kind of drawn to that. However. The other side of Torty, he's the last coach I would have wanted. To be honest with you, <laughs> I'll look the very you. last. I've been totally boxed off to him in terms of most of what he was saying. But no, I think it's. I think life experience is a big thing. Actually, just listen to you there, Jamie. You're talking about young Irish players, Brexit and all that type of thing. So now Irish players um, will rather than that conveyor belt to England, lower division English sides might be a little bit more imaginative now in terms of yeah, players that go to maybe Scotland, etc. But Europe, maybe Belgium, France, Scandinavia, these might be options now mm -hmm. for young Ireland players. And I think in a funny way, people might initially think, oh, they're out there. It's a, almost a step down. But I kind of see it a little bit differently. I never had that experience. I don't have too many regrets. I don't, I don't look back. But I, I, do, I do think, when I do look back, was there any stage in my career, I never thought that way, 
where I could have thought maybe taking a big sidestep, you know, maybe thought of maybe a couple of years abroad, experience something different, a different type of football, different country, different language, different culture, how that would have affected me, like not necessarily earning necessarily a lot more money. So I think young Irish players putting themselves uh, going down that particular road, I think that could help them in a load of different ways, not just in terms of their football and development, but actually as people in terms of their mindset, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, a bit like you've done in terms of that trip to India, and you're saying that was a pivotal moment for you in terms of visually what you saw, how it affected you. Obviously, you had that within you anyway, don't get me wrong. But those type of things, I think, are very interesting. I think that could be very exciting for a lot of Irish players, you know, in terms of being pushed into these other areas, maybe in continental Europe and different experiences. I think potentially that could be a very good thing and a load of different not just purely through that narrow lens in terms of purely your football and development is going to make you a better player. I think a lot of things come into it. You'll know better than me what makes you a better player, mindset, psychology, you know, how you are, how you develop, how you mature, you know, all of those things I think make you a better player, but also a person as well. Because most you've got to live most of your life. You know, we have we all finished thirty five years of age. You've got the rest of your life ahead of you. So you gotta be you gotta be prepared for that as well. Mm, for sure. I think it, 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 like you said how how amazing would it be for a young Irish person now to end up in Italy or or anywhere across Europe now and even further afield who knows what would happen but there's all sorts of brilliant experiences that could come from that even if you don't end up making it as a footballer because yeah. a lot of them won't and I think one of the big things I always try to say to young Irish lads going over is yes you want to dream and strive to be a professional footballer but there's also that realisation that it won't, it won't happen for everyone. Um, and well, you can't just hang your hat on, on that. Gotta say, like, the vast I mean, majority you, won't I you're, you are working with kids who, the vast majority of which, won't actually get a professional contract. Yeah, I, th I think at Man City, actually, they all probably will. Probably the exception. Okay, right. probably the exception. Okay, yeah, 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 is yeah. that right? Okay. But generally, yeah. Yeah, I'd say, I think... Particularly all, working yeah. under Jamie for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to say, course, oh, I'm going to say, say it for him. I'm going to say it for him. Go ahead, Jamie, keep going. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, I think most of the 16-year-olds that we either sign or release will go on to still probably get a pro or at least a scholarship somewhere else. But for the young Irish lads, it can't can't be the all-or-nothing move because that will just crush them if it doesn't happen. So it's just sort of... Give us a name. Any Irish, any couple of, couple of lads over there down there? The, there's a couple... Chain. There's yeah, a, showing a bit, bit, giving a little bit of that. Yeah, there's you know, a couple. There's, lip. One, there's a few. There's one that just went over to the Irish on the 16s last week. So we'll see how he gets on. Um, I don't expect yeah. you to name drop and maybe puts a little bit too much pressure. Yeah. Pressure on them. But yeah, there's a couple of, couple of lads there. I've got a chance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's there's a couple of good ones um, and hopefully more soon as well. You never know. Did he work with Lee Carsley for a while at the academy or did your times miss each other? Yeah, missed each other. He was he had left a year or two before I arrived. Uh, Kennedy? He left the year I oh, arrived, yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Poacher um, turned gamekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, any link up at all or any uh, conversation with, with first team coaches or anything like that? Um, so basically the academy split in two, so you don't see them that often. Yeah. Um, however, you'll just see them in passing, they'll say hello maybe. Um, we've, there's a few players at the moment doing uh, their coaching badges at the moment, so right. um, they come and work with the academy players sometimes as well, which is good. Um, so so that's sort of how you see them more than anything. You show right? them how it's done, like Gundogan comes over and you say, yeah, just sit yourself <laughs> down there, just just watch how it's done. <laughs> yeah, you've seen that Fair one. Sh bit of quiet, I'm doing a session now. <laughs> you put out the cones there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you for a warm up. Yeah. No, no they're, they're super respectful. Yeah, it's that right, co yeah, coaching is so different to playing, and I think they understand that. Nice. Um, it's a totally different kettle of fish. What's really interesting is that if you were coaching that same age group in Ireland, you'd probably have quite a different outlook, or maybe your contemporaries now have a different outlook because at underage level, at schoolboy football, it is very competitive, whereas you're coaching not towards co competition, but more towards, I guess, participation and self-improvement. So can Ireland learn a thing or two from... The, that academy mentality in the UK? Yeah, yeah it's, it's that debate that we all talk about. Is it better to be that side with the competitiveness or this side where it's focused on development? I actually watched an Irish game on Sunday and I spent the first five minutes just laughing because it was just so different to what I'm used to where the parents on the sideline were really animated. You'd never see that. Um, the players and the managers were screaming at the referee. You'd never see that. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't get my head around it because I'd been over there for so long and not seen an Irish game. And it was just it was players saying, I like, hook it and clear it. We just don't see those things as often, which is brilliant. But there is that criticism, sorry, on jumping yeah. again, in terms of the academy system. It's been there for some time, you're probably aware of, and maybe too much of a sterile 
environment for players. I've spoken to play um, people, coaches and stuff, and even in terms of you know twenty three yeah. league over there. And, and where's the point? You got that's you instill that that will to win, kind of winner all costs. Yes, you're looking at player development. You're looking to Im- improve players, and you're, you're building towards something. But the here and the now to actually win, to have that mentality, go onto the pitch and win at all costs, and to kind of instill that. Into do young players still have that, or is that kind of almost beaten out of them, or it's not encouraged enough when they come into the system? Because a lot of the young kids, as you know, probably come in seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. Mm. Uh, they come in, if you're still being told the same things year in year, oh, forget about winning the game, don't worry about winning. No, it's about it's about you, you getting better, it's about the team, team comes first, the patterns of play. This is what we got to concentrate on. But you know, the win will come later. Don't worry about winning so much. Preaching maybe t- uh, uh, too much of that, whether potentially that's that's the right thing. I find that very interesting. No right or wrong, you know what I mean? How do you see it? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a massive debate. Personally, I think we need to add more competition in. And luckily at Man City, because we go on so many trips abroad to these tournaments, we actually get a decent level of competition. Yeah. However, when I was at Reading, we didn't because we couldn't afford to go on those trips and stuff like that. So um, it's those tours and those experiences where you have to win as well that are vital. And I would actually say kids nowadays are just as competitive as we were growing up. Is that right? But, yeah. Oh, you don't get a sense of that? Yeah, you no. Still, you still... I, I still see that, that, particularly when they are just asking, when's the next cup game, lads? When's, yeah. the, when's the next tour we're going yes. on? Because that's the highlight for them, the, the chance that they can go and showcase on in the, mo- in the moments of pressure and go and win a trophy. So, yeah, the, I totally agree. It's a, it, Sometimes you look at under 23 games in England and you're like, this is miles away from what the first team looks like. Well, let me ask you this. Talking about straight jacking uh, players, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you think to a certain extent coaches can be perhaps the straight jacket put on them in the academy, but particularly at a club like Manchester City where you get a sense of, correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of how every team plays from the fourth team down through the academy, everybody has to play the same way. And you would be, as a coach, you would be dictated to in terms of how you set up your team to play, the type of information you're giving players, the type of patterns to play that you're not almost encouraged but you're actually dictated to that you have to roll out onto the training pitch is that the case you think that's a good thing in terms of like um, coach development in terms of improving you as a coach rather than being an environment where a first team manager say well your team set them up as you want play as you want Mm. play whatever system you want style of play it's up to you well, it's amazing because um, there's a famous quote at the start of Moneyball that says it's, a, it's amazing how much you don't know about the game you've played your whole life. And when I went to Man City, that was what it was like because their style and the, and the detail that they go into in terms of the, the 4-3-3, mm. it just blew me away, if I'm totally honest. Yeah. And I learned so much. I'm still learning so much. So um, that was really interesting. But also there's plenty of freedom within the framework to create your own sessions, do whatever you want to do, um, as long as you're working alongside the syllabus and the philosophy so uh, I, it's been extremely beneficial for me for sure because like I said I've just learned so much that, That's really interesting because I think obviously Kenny you're speaking from a, a place of knowledge there but I think the rest of us possibly aren't quite aware of what exists there so there's there's like a, a blueprint this is how this is the Manchester City way essentially Yeah so there's a there's an academy um, curriculum and, and philosophy that this is how we want to play across all the age groups and this is what it should look like Yeah. And what did you learn about the 433 then? Oh, they're all the hidden secrets I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Blue book. Won't yeah. make any sense to him. We just forget it straight away. In one ear now with the other. Football oh, experts like Kenny here to learn. Oh, dear. Unless you've got a slither in yourself. We'll need to get the tactics board out, I think. <laughs> uh, fascinating stuff. So, like, I mean, over the next little while, like, are you in your happy place at the moment? Is, is it a sense that, like, listen, I'd, I'd love to kind of progress through this academy or, or how, how do you see things going career-wise? Yeah, certainly I'd love to progress through the academy and like I said, I'd love to work in competitive football one day, whatever that will look like, whether that's a coach or assistant, who knows. Um, but this year I'm fully focused on my challenges because this is, uh, it's going to be a hell of a year, an exciting year. Remind, sorry, can I do one Selfie stick, yeah, what? <laughs> Surely. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna run. It's not that. Consider what you're doing. A lightweight selfie stick, so we can all yeah. follow you. Surely, hundred percent. I'll, I'll into do that. all that. There's actually room on the boat for one more, Kenny. If you fancy it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me on that boat, would you? <laughs> mentally, mentally, that would be too much for you. <laughs> and I wouldn't be clean at the bottom of the boat either. Uh, Jamie, remind us how people can find out more information and and donate as well so nothingventuredcampaign.com for anyone that would love to donate that would be that would be super and uh, nothing ventured campaign on instagram for anyone that wants to follow the journey see what my training looks like um and uh, and follow see me see what you look like with your top <laughs> off the album <laughs> hey jelly you'd be looking a million dollars home <laughs>
percent. Yeah. Well, good luck with that uh, training. Good luck with social media. You've got a new follower here anyway. Uh, somebody's going to be watching all of the selfie stick. I'm going to try. I'm going to. Pro. Wouldn't be my thing now. Yeah, I'm going to try. Yeah. Oh, you've prompted him. Point me in the right direction. Prompted him to become. Why can't we follow him on the show? Surely he can pop him up for five minutes. You're for that. Most Mondays are. Hundred percent. Yeah. Get you on between marathons and uh, between days of rowing or whatever. The weight drops. He gets more gaunt. <laughs> as, the we- as the weeks go on we'd be saying yeah you look great Jay. he goes off air we'd be saying it looks dreadful don't he oh, stay with him. Oh, God, there. He's, a, he's a shadow that the man was in the studio <laughs> take a picture of that now and after it'll be a very different man yeah. the tan will be gone I can tell you that much uh, you've been listening to Jamie Carr he is uh, an academy coach with Manchester City and has got a fairly busy 2022 ahead to say the least